All right. Um, welcome everybody to the first of our uh, colloquium meetings. This, this colloquium's title is uh, the Mino World after a Mino World Cup. Of course, we have here in class, we have students from Semenas, master's students, as well as undergraduate students. We have several people here on Zoom as well, all to hear from our speaker today, Professor Nikki Akhavan. Um, Professor Akhavan is uh, an associate professor and chair of media at uh, at Catholic at the Catholic University of America in Washington D.C. I believe that's correct. Um, and she is a specialist primarily in in state sponsored media, um, images, gender, and politics and economies in Iran. Uh, I actually ran across Professor Akhavan's work with regard to sports and politics for the first time in this in this book here, Football in the Middle East, edited by Abdullah Al-Aryan. Uh, this came out, I think, December of last year. So right up to in the build up to the Qatar World Cup. Um, very useful book in terms of academics thinking about this relationship between politics and sports on which this colloquium is kind of building on and, and shooting off of. Um, so today uh, is our first first talk talking about things related to sports, geopolitics, economy, sociology, culture in the Middle East with a focus on football, but as a reminder that this is kind of just uh, a framework and a foundation point for us to talk about some of these broader issues that, that arise in this region that we're very interested in and everything that's related to it. Um, so with that, I think I'm just going to let Professor Akavan take us away um, with her presentation today, Scoring Points, Sports and Politics in Iran. So, Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for having me uh, as your first speaker. I'm delighted to be here at the Center for Middle Eastern and North African Studies. And thank you, Professor Dr J. Chrysostomo for inviting me and to Miss uh, Natasha Gruden Alabegovich for all of her help in arranging the details of this talk as well and anybody else who behind the scenes made this possible. Um, if I was going to have if I were having this conversation with you, not today, but in a few days or next week, it would be coinciding with two very different events, which if we were to take those two different events together, they would touch on a lot of the factors that are relevant for understanding the intersection of sports, media and politics in Iran. And um, the first event, as you may have guessed by the first image that I've chosen, it pertains to the one year anniversary of the tragic death of Mahsa Amini in custody last year on September 16th. Uh, this death in custody sparked nationwide protests and also international demonstrations in solidarity uh, known as the Women, Life and Freedom demonstrations. And her death and the protests that followed initiated an ongoing civil di disobedience movement against mandatory hijab and also other state restrictions. And this first image that I've chosen, it's actually not an image from Iran. It's, it's an image from Istanbul. Um, of, it's one of the many solidarity demonstrations that took place thereafter. I chose this image because it centered her and um, I thought it would be respectful to have that as the, the opening image. In the past year, the Iranian authorities have been trying to basically put this genie of resistance back into the bottle through a number of repressive mechanisms aimed at regaining control and further restricting public and pr private spaces. So that is the first event that's coming up in five days, actually. The second event is completely different. And I'm going to move to my next slide here if I can. Um, the second event is what the Asian Football Confederation has called a, quote, historic event, namely that um, Saudi teams will be playing on Iranian soil. Uh, on September 19th, uh, it's the start of the group stage of the a Asian Champions League, and it's going to kick off uh, with the Saudi team Al Nasr playing against um, Tehran's Persepolis. Uh, it's one of the more popular teams in Iran, and they're going to be facing off um, on Iranian soil. 
which itself is a really huge deal. Uh, I open with marking the approach of these two very different things. One, of course, is a somber anniversary of a death, and the second, the celebratory kickoff, because although they're very different, um, they capture the complexities that are relevant to understanding the interplay of sports, politics, and media in Iran. And these factors that they capture include the repressive machinations of the Iranian state and post control over a resisting population, as well as both public and private spaces on the one hand. And then on the other hand, the other set of factors which have to do with how immensely impactful the quickly shifting sands of alliances in the region are in determining the very interplay of sports, politics, and media. The fate of Iranian athletes in this arena, what I, is, I'd like to suggest, reflects that of the Iranian population more generally. So namely, more often than not, Iranian athletes and athletics, mirroring the situation of Iranian population as a whole, end up being collateral damage in political struggles, both domestic and international. And neither athletes, athletics, or ordinary Iranian people um, are able to fully achieve their potentials or goals. Uh, the best way, I think, to illustrate that inner working of these factors and the unfortunate position in which they place Iranian athletes and then by extension the Iranian populace is to walk through a case study together. And since your colloquium series is called the MENA World after a MENA World Cup, um, I thought that the case study that would be most useful um, and most relevant would actually be a discussion of the most recent World Cup. And then at the very end, I'd like to return us to a brief assessment of the present moment, namely this post-World Cup moment that's also on the cusp of the two events that I've opened with. Now, while I can't predict what's going to happen next week, and I, I have to admit, when I was putting this talk together, I thought, man, I should have chosen a later week to go because then I would know what actually happened. But regardless of what happens, it's very clear that we're dealing with a very different sports, media, and politics landscape today than we were just a few months ago um, when the World Cup was um, was happening. And I'd like and and I'll return to those a comparison of the then and now when I conclude the, the talk. So I'll start then with a discussion of Qatar 2022. And as you're going to see in a moment, the story of the Iranian national team, both in the lead up and during the games, is basically taking hit after hit from multiple sides and being ping ponged between attacks by the Iranian authorities on the one side and then on the other side by well-funded elements of the Iranian opposition. And I know I'm mixing sports metaphors by, by talking about ping pong, but I think once you hear my talk, you'll really see them as, as going back and forth between these various sides. And, um, you know, overall, the Iranian team had a very weak showing. They had a miserable time of it. And I suggest it's not for reasons having to just do with their skill set. It, ha it has to do with the broader political and um, media landscape in which they were sort of thrust in. Um, before getting to the details of that particular case study, though, I think it's important for me to give you a very brief sketch of the political and social role of soccer and the place of the national team in post-revolutionary Iran, because that's the best way to see the stark contrast between how they were treated in this war World Cup and how they've been historically treated. So for more than two decades now, um, soccer in Iran has been the site of successful social and political mobilization. Very soon after the Iranian revolution, as part of changes in uh, restricting women's and how and where women could appear, women were outlawed um, from going to stadium games to, to watch men's sports teams. And sometimes starting in the early 2000s, Iranian women's rights activists, they focused on challenging that stadium attendance ban as part of, a, as a central campaign and part of a broader struggle against um, gender discriminatory laws and practices in Iran. And that fight, it's had many ups and downs. It's a whole chapter, it's a whole book by itself. But it's largely a successful story for women's rights activists. They, they haven't fully won yet and they continue to be pushed, but women's rights activists and other activists through a combination of factors on the, um, that were on the ground, you know, 
protests at stadiums, appealing to soccer's uh, governing bodies, and the strategic use of social media, they have managed to receive um, concessions, significant concessions in this regard. And this has been in the face of both state pushback, but also some elements of the state that try to take credit for um, the wins that women have had in this regard. So in addition to soccer functioning as a literal and figurative site for organizing for social change, individual soccer players have also used their status as beloved public figures to support not just women in this particular fight for stadium attendance, but also in support for other struggles. So the next slide I have for you, this is um, this is from 2019. This is what would have otherwise been a kind of an unremarkable World Cup qualifying game because it was Iran versus Cambodia. Cambodia is a much weaker team. It, you know, it wasn't going to be a, it's not one of these make or break games, but it became a historic game because it was one where women were a allowed to attend and there were 3,000 women who were able to take the stands. And the team members showed their support, the Iranian national team members showed their support in a number of ways. They were interviewed in the press, um, in the Iranian press. There are many quotes from players saying, oh, this was an extra special game because women were there. And since then, when there have been games that women have been um, able to attend, you'll see the players when they when they win a goal or they or they want, you know, they want to celebrate something, they'll they'll turn to the women and um, acknowledge their presence. So that show of support has on the pitch um, has also been very important. But um, the Iranian soccer team and soccer players, their support has not been limited to issues having to do with women's attendance at soccer games. I mean, you would think, okay, that's relevant. They, these people want to see, uh, the women want to see them play. So of course they, it's relevant to them. They, they will show support, but in other cases too, they have taken, um, political stances and the most well-known one, which I'm going to show the, the next image, this is from 2009, um, up until the well, up until that point in 2009, uh, the biggest protest that had happened in post-revolutionary Iran happened after a disputed presidential election. Uh, the demonstrations then were known as the Green Movement. I'm sure many of you have heard of them, and the qualifying for games for the World Cup coincided with that summer of protests and. Um, in solidarity with the green movement, you can see in this image in the team, three of the team members are wearing green wristbands in a show of solidarity with the green movement. And this is in addition to comments that they made on and off um, in, in press conferences and also um, in, in their personal capacity. So again, you can see that there is this kind of history of uh, support or engagement by the national team and also league teams for what's going on in the ground um, in Iran. So there's a lot more I can say in this regard. But to sum up this background, post-revolutionary soccer in Iran has a history of being politicized as a site where activists and athletes alike could push for, for change. Now, as part of this, the soccer teams and the national team specifically have been sacrosanct. Soccer was a perfect site for demanding social change and performing acts of solidarity by fans and players, precisely because of its universality in Iran as a beloved sport with beloved players and fans across various sectors of society. So the idea of sports watching, washing was not a part of the lexicon of assessing uh, Iranian soccer. So sports watch as it's generally understood, as I'm sure all of you know, is when people, organizations, and states in this um, in this case, use sports as a vehicle for enhancing their own image. And of course, everybody uses sports for enhancing their own image. We know all these. Um, but in this case of sports washing, it's about when you usually have a very bad reputation. So you're trying to distract from your bad reputation but um, at the same time, either by owning some fancy team or hosting big events like the Olympics, you associate yourself with the good vibes, essentially, of the sport. You, you associate yourself with these big players and at the same time distract from whatever horrible things that you're trying to you know, hide. Um, but in the Iran case, um, because sports and soccer in particular have been a site where fans, activists, and players themselves have brought attention to the state's discriminatory actions and state wrongdoing, the concept of sports washing, it has not been a useful framing. 
Of course, this is not to say that the Iranian authorities have not tried to use soccer in the service of their own agendas. They have, and they continue to do that. But um, they've had a hard time of it uh, until the World Cup, and I'll say more about that um, in a minute, because the, it's always been imbricated with how fans and activists and athletes themselves have used platforms, uh, have used soccer as a platform for uh, pushing back against this state. Uh, despite this history, however, this long history, relatively long history, uh, in 2022, the national team itself became a political target, um, changing how activists and the state use soccer to push their respective agendas. Um, and this is the period we're talking in the lead up to the World Cup. So in the six months, particularly before the World Cup, where um, you now hear claims about sports washing enter the conversation about Iran. And there's emergence of calls to exclude Iranian teams from international arenas altogether. In a major shift of attitudes towards a national team in 2022, Iranians abroad initiated campaigns to identify the squad itself as supporters of the Iranian state. So rather than calling them by their nickname of Team Emeli, the, Iran, the national team, that's what everybody calls them, they, these primarily diasporic Iranians began referring to them as the team of the Islamic Republic. Both the label and the campaigns against the team received attention on foreign-funded Persian-language satellite channels and foreign-funded Persian-language media in general. The Saudi, oops, I, Sorry about that. The Saudi-funded Iran International allotted significant broadcast time to these campaigns, and it published content online in both English and Persian that played a big role in disseminating these ideas. In addition, individual anchors and on-air personalities of the channel took an active role on Twitter and other platforms to magnify this message. Um, I'm focusing on this outlet in particular, not only because it played the most visible and effective role in promoting this campaign against the national team, I, I think it can be fairly described as an engine of the campaign, not just as somebody who is not, not just as a platform or outlet that was covering the news. It really was pushing the campaign. Um, but that's not the reason I focus only on them. I think there are many other outlets that were involved. But importantly, I focus on it because it was a Saudi uh, funded outlet. And this, of course, was happening before the Iran-Saudi Iran rapprochement that happened just this spring, where Iran and Saudi Arabia, at this point, were still confronting each other um, via multiple proxies on the ground, online, and on the airwaves. Um, and so um, when we look at the actual campaign against the national team, which I'm finally going to move to, um, you can... When we see the no-win situation that the Iranian team was placed in, it's in this broader context, not just of what's going on inside Iran, the demonstrations against the state, not just the pressures that the um, athletes are fa facing from the Iranian state, but also this bigger context of Iran regional rivalries that are playing out on the airways as well. So finally, I'm going to move to the actual campaigns against the, um, the national team. Um, the campaigns against the national team, they were actually already in motion well before Mahsa Amini died in custody on September 16th. Um, but her death, of course, and the demonstrations that immediately started were right at this period where everybody was gearing up for the World Cup itself. The friendlies had started, the pre um, the, the pre cup friendlies that are, were starting. So the timing was quite... Um, it was a dark time in, in terms of what was happening on the ground in Iran. Um, the maligning of the Iranian national team intensifies, though, right when the protests happen. Okay, they were already in, 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 in motion against the team, but the protests sort of intensify these attacks on the Iranian national team. And they came despite the fact that um, the national team, again, both as a team and as individual members, had taken a number of actions to show their solidarity with the Iranian protesters. So on September 27th, um, 11 days after Mahsa Amini dies, there was a friendly match with Senegal. This is the image that I jumped the gun and I meant um, that I now mean to show you. Um, the players, they wore their black, um, they 
black jackets covering their national colors and symbols during the national anthem. And this was widely seen as a sign of mourning and solidarity. Um, also in September, the team striker uh, Sardar Azamun had posted explicit messages of support for protesters on his Instagram. And he also said on his Instagram that the team was being prevented by the Iranian authorities from expressing support for the, for the protesters. So very early on, it was clear that again, as a team and individually, they were ex uh, um, expressing solidarity with the protesters. But this then brings me to the pressures that the Iranian authorities were bringing to bear on the team at the same time. So not long after Sardar Azmoun posted the message of solidarity with the protesters, um, he actually posted an apology later, a, a, a apology remark online, which of course signaled that he had been right in the first place, that you know his claim was, they're preventing us from, from saying what we really feel, and then he was made to apologize. So clearly he was right in, in what he had noted about the official uh, pressures. Um, in addition to preventing and or threatening the Iranian team members from expressing their political views or showing solidarity, the Iranian, state used the team for its own um, PR and political purposes. Um, on November 14th, so this is right when they were leaving for um, for Doha, they made the Iranian team go meet President Raisi. I, I'm going to have this picture for you. This is the meeting. Um, really, I mean, you, none of them look very happy if we were going to do if we were going to do analysis of body language. But anyway, I, I, I'm not going to get into that business of how anybody was feeling, because of course, I don't know. But the point is that this meeting um, was then used uh, against the team, of course, because a lot of people who were supporting the protests were outraged by the fact that they took this group group photo with the president. And this is including people who had not been calling for a boycott of the national team. They were still very upset to see this. Now, individual players and team attempts after this meeting to rectify the, the, um, the fact that they had met with um, President Raisi were only partially successful. Uh, at a press conference before the opening game with England, one of the players um, acknowledged the situation in Iran and expressed his sympathy for the families of those killed during the protests. There were several players, so again, on an, um, during these press conferences, and also still in their personal capacities on social media sites, pointed that their hearts were with the people in Iran. Um, now, sig the most significant thing that happened in this period was that when they went out on the pitch um, before the game with England, a, a game which they lost very miserably, 6-2, to two, um, they refused to sing the national anthem. Um, I have a still from that. I, I, I mean, I suppose I could have shown you the, a clip of them not singing, but this is a still from them refusing to um, sing the national anthem. So you can see... Uh, even so far in the lead up to the games and during the games, that there's this constant back and forth where the team and individual athletes are trying to calibrate the very difficult position they find themselves in. And um, the symbolic actions that they, the team took, as well as statements individual athletes made publicly, garnered some sympathy among fans, including those who pointed to them as evidence for the, call, for the folly of uh, calling for the team's boycott. Overall, however, the team remained a lightning rod for criticism throughout the World Cup. So when they did this, when they refused to sing the national anthem, there were many officials, um, including members of parliament, city council members, number of op-eds that were circulating by, in hardline outlets inside Iran, who were just furious at them for disrespecting the flag, disrespecting the anthem. And at the same time, none of these actions that they were taking, the team was taking, was appeasing the, um, the extremists on the other side who had wanted to exclude them from the games altogether, the people who had been calling them the team of the Islamic Republic, who had called for boy boycotts, et cetera. So in short, the team and the athletes were caught up trying to walk this fine line between the two sides. And not only did they not manage to appease either side, but more often than not, they ended up making everybody more angry. If the team wasn't able to successfully navigate the dual pressures of the state and boycotters, 
there were actually those on this in the stadium and um, in public spaces in Iran who were better placed to refuse this polarity. I think my main argument to you all is that the po polarity dominated, and it's um, in this period because of state funding inside Iran, state funding outside Iran, or foreign funding outside Iran. So the people who have the most extreme views have the most money. Surprise, their views um, are able to dominate. But there were many people who, despite not having the means to get their voices out, try to overcome this, um, refuse this po polarity. So the next slide I wanna show you, for example, is there were fans who attended the game who acknowledged what was going on in Iran, who brought attention to what was going on in Iran, but at the same time were supporting the team. Um, there were actually a smaller number of people who attended in protests, who were there to just heckle the Iranian team. And that is the most, that that's, that component is the disturbing component, which also um, has a reflection inside Iran, the sort of rift and the polarization that's increasing. Um, there were many videos that circulated of, well, not many videos, but there were some videos circulating of people fighting in the stands um, and outside the stadiums, you know, among Iranians themselves. And um, this rift was also evident when, for example, uh, Iran lost to England 6-2, to two, as I mentioned earlier, and they lost to um, the U.S. 1-0. to zero. There were, in fact, some celebrations in the street inside Iran. Um, and, you know, thus far, I brought attention I've sort of been picking on the diaspora um, and talking about foreign funded media, but it's important to, of course, acknowledge there were people inside Iran who were also against the national team and against, um, uh, were rooting against the team. I mean, they, they're the audience for these Persian language media. So it, it also, that sort of makes sense as well. Now, whereas the campaigns against the national team may have hurt the team itself, um, you know, their morale was terrible. They did terrible. Um, the boycotts effort um, did hurt them. I mean, they ended up going, but it hurt them. It did not hurt the Iranian state. As a matter of fact, it provided the state with more fodder for its own agenda. So predictably, for example, when there were people pro, uh, dancing in the streets when Iran lost, um, Iranian state-sanctioned media they they had a ball with it. They um, they were then able to use these celebrations. There were not, there were not many of them, but they were able to use it to smear all the protesters, to smear everybody, and say, ah, you see, this is everything. All of this is the result of Western psychological warfare. It's evidence of um, the fact that these protesters are just all traitors. They'd rather side with the enemy. Um, so they use they were able to use it to malign not just people celebrating in the streets, but the entire protest movement um, as, as a whole. And it wasn't just when Iran lost that the state was able to uh, use, use the team for its own agenda. When they won, and the one win that they had against Wales, they were also able to use um, the narrative for them um, in, in their own benefit. So the next thing I want to show you here is, um, this is Kehan newspaper, the why sort of regarded as the mouthpiece of um, the Supreme Leader, one of the, the most hardline papers in, in the country. And the title here is, says Iran 2, um, Wales, Israel, Al Saud, and all the um, traitors inside and outside Iran, zero. And the photos that were accompanying the headline, you can see, um, included a fan in the stands holding up a picture of assassinated IRGC General Qasem Soleimani. And um, uh, again, they were they were able to craft their own sort of, like win or loss, it doesn't matter from the perspective of the Iranian state because there's, they have the, um, the ability to weave a narrative that supports what, how they want to malign the protesters. Now, my um, one of the point things that I would like to sort of say now, although it's maybe something that's better left for the question and answer session, is that one might say, oh, well, isn't this always the case? Aren't they always able to craft their own narrative? And what I'd like to suggest to you is that they were better able to do it in this World Cup 
than any other time because that middle was excluded because there was no longer this um, national team was no longer sacrosanct. People were, you know, there was boycotting them. So there wasn't this national solidarity with the team. And so then um, there was no pushback, whereas there's been pushback all the other times when this when the state has tried to say, um, to craft the narrative. There's activists, there's fans, there's people who are, along with the activities of, of, the, of the team itself, able to push back. But now there's this like power vacuum. Well, there's a narrative vacuum, not a power vacuum, also power too, but a narrative vacuum that the state can then step into. Um, okay, I think I've lost my own track of my own notes here. Um, but I let me let me see here. I think I can sum this section up to say that under pressure from the state and the opposition alike, what Amina World Cup meant for the Iranian team was a series of lose-lose situations on and off the field in Qatar 2022. Extremist voices aided by state funding and support dominated inside Iran and extremist voices also aided by foreign state funding and support dominated outside Iran. Anybody calling for moderation, for sports diplomacy, for seeing, you know, for returning to a time where you could use the sport as a platform for political change um, did not find a welcome home in domestic or foreign funded Persian language media inside or outside Iran. And a good place to see this um, is with the last image I'd like to share with you. I, I have a few more things I wanna say, but this is my last image. Um, and this is uh, this is after Iran's loss to the US. So the, the loss that, which basically, if they had equalized, they still could have advanced, but this was what guaranteed that they would not um, advance out of the group stage. And as you can see here, uh, a US player is consoling an Iranian player and there, and you know, there were these images captured of the two teams sort of, you know, having a friendly, um, friendly, friendly exchanges. And you didn't see this obviously circulated widely in, in the spaces that I've just described. So there were people who pointed to these pictures and said, look, this is the best of sportsmanship. This is the best of the healing power of sports. This is people to people diplomacy, people to people connection. But the dissemination of these images and the ideas, they were not widespread and they were largely limited to individual users and fans. In the end, polarizing narratives by the state media in Iran and foreign funded Persian language media abroad prevailed in Qatar 2022. Now, unfortunately, this polarization also characterizes the positions that ordinary Iranians overall are caught up in. In other words, the situation and dilemmas faced by the Iranian national team are a microcosm of Iranian, study, uh, Iranian society and politics more generally. Um, there's the actual case of what happened to the national team, which I've just outlined, all the pressures they faced and they couldn't get out of it. And then there's the national team as a metaphor um, or symbol for ordinary Iranians who, like the national team in this period, were facing the repressive arm of the Iranian state, but they're also being used to promote particular political agendas by Iranians abroad, where those diaspora Iranians were using, again, platforms provided by other foreign states. Um, so now that we have that picture, maybe a more detail than you ever wanted, but now that we have that picture, we can return, I think, to the present moment. Now Qatar 2022 is in our rear view, and we're looking at the smart sports media and politics landscape as it stands now. Now, what hasn't changed is the intransigence of the Iranian state in the face of the demand in the face of the demands of the ordinary people and the movements. So while um, acts of civil disobedience and demands to end mandatory hijab and other state restrictions continue, um, the state has not budged. In fact, in the lead up to uh, the anniversary of Masa Amini's death, it's taken a number of other measures. For example, the most recent, and I think the most relevant for all of us in this room is uh, recent actions they've taken against university professors. A bunch of new professors were hired, a bunch of students were under pressure because now, now school is gonna be, they start a little bit later than us. Um, and so the crackdown, that's continued. So Iranian state hasn't really changed. The key difference between now and then I'd like to suggest is the Saudi-Iran rapprochement that was brokered by China and, and announced in March of this this year. Um, you know, they, the Saudi-Iran relationship was rocky for 
quite a number of years and it had sort of was starting to get super bad, I think 2014 on, but 2016 is when Saudi Arabia cut off all diplomatic ties with Iran. And in the se in, in the seven years since that time, both of the countries were intensifying their both their information and on the ground proxy wars against each other. So 2016, official break of relations, and 2017, by 2017, Iran International, the platform that I mentioned at the outset, um, was established by Saudi funds. Now, when the rapprochement, when the agreement between Saudi Arabia and Iran was announced in March, the reports that came out indicated that one of the things that the two countries had talked about was a specification from the Iranian side asking them, asking the Saudis, to have Iran International tone down its coverage. Now, just last week, which is the same week that Iran and Saudi Arabia formally exchanged ambassadors, um, officially ending their diplomatic rupture. There had been a number of like moves towards this in, in the la in, since March, but the official rupture was healed, so to speak, last week. That same week, there were key departures from Iran International, including that of a leading figure in promoting campaigns such as the one against the Iranian national team, um, and I think one or two other folks as well. So. We have that, we have um, the ambassadors exchange, Iran International toned down, could be a coincidence, probably not a coincidence, these changes at Iran International. And then we have this upcoming event that I opened the talk with, um, and the Asian Champions League with Saudi teams, two Saudi teams playing actually, Iranian teams, Al Nasr and Al Ittihad, both of who have very you know, fancy players on their team, playing in the Iranian Tehran teams and Esfahan teams, and the games are in Iran. So compared to the case of Qatar 2022, where diasporic media and social media spaces abounded with calls to exclude Iran from international spaces, international competitions, there's been like very little attention um, this round. In fact, I've had to tell a number of people, including people who are soccer fans, like, what do you guys think? You know, what do you think of Ronaldo going to um uh, Iran next week, and and ah, oh, that's happening. You know, it's, it's been very toned down. Now, this time last year, so even before the death of Mahsa Amini, but especially, of course, during the protest and during the World Cup, it would have been unfathomable to think that in less than a year, the regional dynamics were going to shift so greatly that the region's next big tournament is going to be kicked off on Iranian soil saudi teams are gonna play there for the you know for the last seven years they've been playing whenever they had to face off against each other they played on like a neutral neutral territory i don't know how that was determined but that's how the games were played and that not only were would they be playing each other in iran but they'd be playing each other in the context of restored relations now again how those games are going to play out what's going to happen after Massa amini's death remains to be seen you know things can turn on the flip of a coin there's all kinds of wheeling and dealing that's happening in the region but for the purposes of this talk and what i tried to illustrate in in this whole talk and i hope i've managed to convince at least some of you is that um i've tried to bring attention to the ways that iranian athletes and athletics in a way that mirrors the position of iranians more generally are really caught in the crosshairs of domestic and international rivalries and that the interplay of sports, media, and politics provides us like with a, a sort of panoramic view of what these dynamics look like. And I mean, unfortunately, what it looks like, I think for athletics and, and for the Iranian population is still that they're unable because they're caught between these uh, sort of warring uh, power structures internally, externally, it's very hard for them to exercise the agency that they've tried to exercise on the ground and on, on the pitch, but that is the, the dynamic and, and it's a dynamic that can change at any moment. And I think I just hit it at 42 minutes. So thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Professor Akhavan. Um, so we obviously have plenty of time for conversation, discussion, ex ex position on these points. Um, I personally have so much more to ask you and and I absolutely loved the way you framed this, how you talked about 
this polarity and having the the national team kind of stuck in the middle here. But I don't want to uh, take everything. So I want to first see, does anybody else have questions, comments for Professor Akhavan to get us started? Yeah. Hi, Professor Akhavan. My name is Azar. Um, it was very, it was a very strange feeling listening to you because I was one of the high school students who was going to the stadium, Azadia Stadium, now like 12 years ago. <laughs> so it was very strange feeling to be part of this narrative that you were describing, but I really appreciated the clarity of the narrative and how complicated it is to factor in all of these forces and voices. Um, I wanted to point or ask two questions. Um, just in the midst of all that ping ponging that you were describing, um, I think there was also a sense among the ordinary Iranians that that the ones that were sympathetic to the demonstrations that um, all of the drama of football and then at some point it became Ali Karimi became such a figure and then you know his departure to join the a very again odd configuration of opposition uh, leaders um, is started to take away from the movement leaders inside and it started to shadow or you know eclipse their voices or distract them or even among a lot of activists it was the you know they were disappointed that so many so many youth are now being just just they're just following this drama and you know, perhaps forgetting about coming out to the street. So I remember there was some point that when there was, um, you know, one of those um, fake celebrations, you would see the guards outside dancing um, when Iran won against Wales. And um, a lot of people were upset about how, you know, the, that that was one thing that I was wondering, you know, among everything that you're saying. And I don't think these these people were influenced by foreign media. I think there was a genuine um, upsetness about that. But the other thing I'm wondering is that, um, do you ever think uh, comparatively about football in Iran and all these other instances of, uh, especially the US, you know, like just this big history of civil rights and and sports? I wonder, um, I wonder how, how you think about um, framing football in connection to sports in Iran, but, with keeping in mind all these other cases or like how would that look like and i have many more questions i will email you you it's fascinating to listen to you so thank you very much yes pl please email me and um i love that you were one of the people you know that was in the, on the ground you probably have more to tell us than than i could ever because i was just you know following this stuff from afar and you know admiring it um from afar so to your first point of, about it being a distraction and again i take your point and i and i acknowledge it like not not everybody of course is you know influ if we say everybody is influenced by the the foreign outlets then then we end up sounding like the iranian authorities right who just want to blame who want to assign no agency they don't want to acknowledge any any of the legitimate demands of the people so i i take your point completely i think um what you're describing because that specific case that you said about the guards that were celebrating that people were also mad and i saw and i in fact i saw this on the foreign media the persian media they were mad even at the team for being happy when they when they scored against wales so it was like they were under a microscope i think of every single reaction if they were un if they showed if they showed solidarity or if they looked unhappy that wasn't enough but if they were happy then that was some kind of you know that was also used against them again by both sides um so I think that complexity now whether whether the question is there's there was this bigger question like should anybody celebrate should should there be any anything that distracts from the protest that's a different kind of question I I think and I think that's one that's a legitimate question but um I think my personal view is that if you can use that soccer as a platform and that kind of connects to your second question if you can use the the soccer as a worldwide platform for bringing attention to what's going on in your country, even if you don't have that much space, you know, even if you're restricted by your by your home 
country, then that that is more powerful than being excluded all altogether because you're you're losing the ability to have this international audience and to have this international engagement. Now, the comparative question is a tougher one. Um, I think because you know one of the things that I was thinking about is actually the women's soccer team, the American women's soccer team, this last World Cup, because some of the attacks against the American women's soccer team, I thought were very similar to what happened to the Iranian team, because they too, you know, I, I don't know if you were following, but when they lost or they didn't do too well, that sort of same polarity, I mean, a different po polarity, but the polarities that you see in the U.S. as well, there were tons of people celebrating that they had lost, tons of Americans celebrating an American loss because they didn't agree with the politics of the um, soccer players uh, because they, you know, their progressive politics and, and, and whatnot. So I think that's also an interesting comparison because it places us in the, in the present context. The other case study that I think is comparable is the issue of state ownership, um, like UAE or Saudi I, I, of um, league, international leagues. Um, I saw something interesting just before, just this morning, um, an article about how there's some movement to try to exclude state ownership of of leagues, like by yeah. And then in those conversations, don't quote me on this because I didn't get a chance to closely look at it, but I saw some Saudi activists who were saying, you know, you can have both. You can still you can be happy that a Saudi owned team is doing well, but it, but you can also use it as a way to critique Saudi human rights record or what have you. And I thought that was like, that's closer to, I think my own assessment of how this space can be used. But of course I'm, I'm open to other comparisons or to think about it differently. Okay, thank you. Uh, other questions? Hi. Um do you know of any other sports teams in the Middle East and North Africa that have a similar role as the Iranian national team? I I wish I was a comparative person, but no, I I don't I don't know. I mean, I think the book that um uh that the professor held in front I yeah, I see it on the slide there. I think there's articles in there that speak to those um dynamics in other places in the region. I, I'm, I'm afraid I'm, I'm not there yet in terms of the comparative work. But I mean, famously, yes, famously, this is the sort of, this is why I think soccer is such a wonderful, I mean, maybe it's this case, I just love soccer, but I, I think it's so, so, so powerful because it does have these histories and um, uh, the way that it can reflect and sort of engage with with local and global politics. I think your comparison to the U.S. women's team at the World Cup just this past month or two ago is is really apt. Um, but I think Iran's national team has has always had this kind of different purpose, like you were pointing out, right? Like that it has served not as a tool of the state, but rather as this as this platform for activism and for social revolution. So I think that's really interesting how that's kind of starting to shift now as you're arguing it's fascinating it might shift back again you know that's sure. the but but that was a that was a big break i thought that rift was a a big one yeah for sure um i feel like you could maybe make the argument that morocco's national team um played a pretty big role like besides um like, I feel like they had like a state and international role in terms of like the Middle East. And a lot of people were very proud of their team for like representing like the Middle East as a whole. Um, but the question that I want to ask is the picture that you have up right now, when I was seeing it in like American media um, and like on social media, a lot of people were saying like, I wonder if the Iranian players are going to get like punished for losing. Have you heard that narrative at all? And like, do you have any comments on that? Well, first, I'm I'm actually surprised, pleasantly surprised that you that you saw the image before and you saw it circulating. No, as far as I know, I mean there may have been, but but it, I think they wanted to push that 
image and that story out of everybody's mind. I didn't see anything. That's not to say that there isn't because, because these poor guys, like they're always stuck and in the middle of all the, the push and pull of the internal and external politics. And many of these people, um, even though Iranian players, are less integrated in, into the international league system than maybe some other countries, but they still see, you know, folks on the pitch in, in the context of other games. And so that personal connection is, is going to be there, but no, I didn't see anything about them being, being punished. Um, they just sort of, but, but I'll look into that. That's a, that's a really good question. And I agree with you about Morocco. Morocco is, is very, very interesting in terms of how people, the shifting identification, you know, first as a Arab team, then a Muslim team, then like everybody, look at this is the only African team. This like the, it brought so many layers of identification from so many people that, um, I mean, it's a very special team in that. I think it was their World Cup. I think that uh, they're sort of the opposite of the Iranian team in terms of they, they got a lot of love and a lot of glory and the Iranian team got a lot of hate and no glory. <laughs> yeah, I do wonder about the um, whether there was much empathy towards the players as individuals, right? So you you talked about um, uh, Azmun initially speaking out against the state, um, but then what, I guess was threatened with losing his place in the national team, right? Or something yeah, like that. Yeah, he he mentioned something about it, and even one of the guys there. Oh, sorry. Let me. Let me why don't you finish your question before? Oh, I well, breathe. and then we have um, we have the case of I'm sorry, I've forgotten his name, but the the very popular player, the, the retired player who's Ali Kadri, having, the as yeah. I just mentioned, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Who's who's been jailed right for for siding with the protesters? Oh, oh, I think you're talking about somebody else. You're talking about a league player, but but Ali Karimi is outside the country. So he's, but you, you may be talking about other, because there are people, there are league players who are, who are also um, in trouble for, for speaking out in, in support of the protests. Um, but I'm sorry, what, what was the end of your question? No, go ahead. That, that was basically my question of just kind of trying to understand whether or not from the people's perspective, was there was there much empathy for these players being stuck in the middle of not really protesting, but kind of protesting that sort of thing? I don't, not really. I mean, there may have been, but again, you know, who was telling the stories? You know, like you didn't have room for for these stories to come out. Although I have to say, in the last few months, I've been seeing um, on social media, not in any platform, but I've been seeing people sort of now that things have settled, well, they may not be settled given what's coming, but people have been saying, hey, re hey, remember those of you who picked on the Iranian national team, remember when you guys did this? It's a kind of like tra a, a traumatic retelling in social media spaces, sort of of um, like recounting that narrative and saying how unfair people were to the team. But also again, to speak to the point that I think Azad is, is her name, yes, um, was saying that, you know, this was all taking place when there were more, you know, there, people were dying on the street. And so I think there wasn't as much attention to let me have some empathy now for the particular players. But in retrospect, I hope and I think that there is some space for, for reconsidering the way that those folks were sort of singled out and um, became pawns in this bigger game. Other questions? Otherwise, I'm probably going to start dominating the, the questioning. Um, so one, one thing I did want to ask you is whether or not there was a stark difference between what we were seeing from state-sponsored media or, you know, states popularizing media as opposed to social media at the time. Um, were we seeing that those kinds of middle voices in social on social media? I think very, very rarely, because I think um, the sort of the prevailing narrative, I think, worked that if you try to have there was it was a you are with us or against us on both sides, you know, like so even if you're a full on supporter of the protest, you know, as I am, you know, like I, I, I 100 percent. Right. But I would 
not go and say in those moments i would not have i mean i I got off of twitter because of elon musk anyway but even if i was on twitter i wouldn't have felt comfortable going online in the middle of those protests and saying hey guys let's take it easy on the national team i just i i think i would have been too afraid of the pushback because there was a really sort of nightmarish polarity online of uh, as well so I think there were people who said that, and I and I saw people who who took that sort of nuanced view. But in the middle of crises, nuanced views are not welcome. I mean, here we are on the anniversary of nine eleven. If I mean, I don't know if anybody other than me is old enough to remember um, in the aftermath of nine eleven. But there's when there's a crisis, when there's a tragedy, n- nobody wants to hear about nuance, right? It takes a while to kind of digest it, and and if you if you try to give a nuanced view, then more likely than not, you'll be attacked by by either side. I think that was the case. But I, but again, with the shifting media landscape and the shifting political landscape, I'm actually hopeful. You know, I know in the when I gave you the abstract for my talk, I promised that I would have a hopeful something in there, and I didn't put anything hopeful. But now I'm going to use this moment to put in that hope, <laughs> which is that I um, I do hope that in the this shifting landscape, there will be time for reflection to look back and say, hey, this is what happened during this crisis. And when we're moving forward, I, I hope we don't fall victim um, to these polarizing uh, narratives because the losing the losers are the ordinary Iranians. The loser is not the Iranian state. The loser is not whoever is you know on the other extreme. Um, I don't know how hopeful that is, but it's it's all I got. No, I mean, that sounds like a very pertinent thing for us to remember right now. Um, are there other questions real quick before I ask more? <laughs> I think we have an online question. Oh, great. Um, can, can you read it for me? If somebody raised their hand. Yeah. Um, yeah, James, can you put your can you put your question into the question and answer for us and then we could read it off? You know what? I think I might actually just. All right. I'm actually going to just allow you to talk. Uh, Here we go. So go ahead, Dr. Dorsey. We can't hear you if you're speaking right now. Hmm. Yeah, unfortunately, we can't hear you. So if you do have something you want to add or a question, you can go ahead and put it in the chat or the Q&A or something like that. We can come back to it. Okay. In the meantime, are there other questions in? Yeah. On what? Hey. Okay. So, yeah. So my question is that to what extent do you see that the involvement of sportmen in those kind of issue as a positive thing? I, I see it. I mean, my overall sense about it is, um, is optimistic. And I, and I think it's perfectly legitimate and uh, wonderful that athletes use their positions as beloved sort of public figures. um, And as, you know, skilled, um, skilled athletes to, to bring attention to whatever um, political, uh, I think it's fair for them to share their political views. Again, the parallel to the women's soccer team, um, you know, a lot of times they'll get pushed back. They will get dragged in uh, either an extremist press or just even the mainstream press. But I I think it's a important, it's an important platform. Now that's, that's not to say that I think, so here's where it gets a little bit complicated. I don't, I have a different 
a sort of view on whether they should be compelled to say something. You know, some people are just not the type who would otherwise uh, share their political or social views. But if they have them and if they want to share them, then I, I support it and I think it's a wonderful opportunity. And that's why I'm against any any type of um, sanctions against uh, Iranian presence in the international arena. I know this has become very, very popular lately, not just Iranian sports, but oh, no, no Iranian cinema, no Iranian, like they just want to cut off any sort of cultural or uh, sports exchanges under the pretense that these people represent the the state. And I think when you look at the histories, the cultural history, the sports history, so much of uh, Iranian sports, media, and, and culture, despite the claw of the state, has been a site for resistance. And so um, I think to shut it off from either extreme is, is, a, is a big disservice to Iranians, to people everywhere. Okay. I guess I can ask my qu another question I have, <laughs> if you don't mind. Sure, of course. Um, so President Biden just announced as of Sunday, this economic corridor between Europe, uh, the Middle East and India. Um, and he specifically names Saudi and Iran as part of this economic corridor. I know this is kind of brand new. Um, do you have any initial thoughts on how Iran? this might impact things? Well, hmm? if, I don't think Iran is part of it. It's UAE and Saudi. I'm not positive. This is because, you know what I thought when I heard it is I thought, oh, now maybe like the rapprochement will go out the door because the power has shifted yet again. Because who needs Iran if you can just go around them? But I'm not sure. So you're asking me a very hard question because the news just broke and I don't even know the details, but... I'm pretty sure Iran was not part of it, though. You're right. I I misread. It was uh, it was UAE and Saudi that was name checked yeah. in it. Yeah. Yeah. So we might. I mean, again, you know, my my whole sort of framing for this talk in a way was kind of around the Iran Saudi relationship as well. But that's subject to change because this this new corridor, if you can just circumvent Iran, then you know who needs them, and so. <laughs> So, uh, but I'd have to look more into that. I mean, there there may have been uh, reassurances that the Iranians gave that they said, "Hey, we'll leave the, we'll let you go through the Persian Gulf. We won't, we won't make trouble." So, in that sense, the, Iran may have made some concessions because there's also talk, as you know, of some kind of continued Iran-U.S. talks. So, who knows on on that end? But but that's all I know. I know as much as you know. Thank you. I have one more question. Um, as you were describing in the beginning, um, uh, this issue of football and politics in Iran has a history. Um, there is, uh, so my question is, uh, who do you draw from in terms of scholarship and scholars and historians who have paid attention to football or leisure in, 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 in relationship to politics uh, that you might make suggestion for somebody who's trying to uh, look into it. I myself, my um, proposed dissertation is about oil um, in, in Abadan, and Abadan has a big history with football. Yes. And as it turns out, actually, the British brought football to, to southern Iran, and they brought it with the hope of kind of producing a certain type of worker that is very, you know, punctual and um, masculine and all of those ideas. But one of the things that I'm trying to look at is how some of the early strikes of oil workers is in connection to activities that is happening among oil workers in football clubs. So it's kind of like backfired uh -huh. on them. Uh, but, uh, but I'm realizing there's not much to look at in terms of scholars that who have written on football, historians maybe. Um, but I'm wondering if you have suggestions to read more about this. Sure. Well, in the Iranian case, I would suggest Hushang Shehabi, who's written a lot about Iran. I mean, you've probably come across his yeah. work as well. And, um, you know, I, I've read his stuff on on soccer, but he's also written on like the Zurkhuneh, that which I haven't read yet. It, 
which is really interesting because there's all this kind of, apparently there's a history about gender there too and, and who can and cannot participate in that. Um, in terms of contemporary stuff, I actually read uh, the the Dr. Dorsey, who was trying to ask a question, I think. <laughs> He's my sort of like, uh, what's going on in, in the in the world sort of soccer more broadly and in the region in, in particular but i'm not a sports I'm, I'm not a sports historian i'm not even a historian i'm a i'm a media studies person right and so that gives me a, um and i love soccer but the, i sort of accidentally came to start writing about this stuff because um uh, my broader area of interest has a lot to do with a sort of crossover of state media, not not just the straits repressive arm, but what kind of stuff the Iranian state, let's say, tries to do um, culturally, like what kind of films they produce, what kind of um, what kind of cultural products they support. And so that was sort of my entryway into into this topic, looking at it from the perspective of resistance, culture and uh, state repression. And so that that um, I, I know that there's a lot of literature there and, and sports history in particular, but that's not my my area of expertise specifically. But of course, you know, the two people I named, I think, and you probably know them. So uh, I think those folks, and there are, and I know that um, Hushang Shahabi is very um, responsive because I, I talked to him about, some of the stuff about football after one of these talks, in fact. So I would I would reach out to him if you haven't done so already. Any other Any questions? questions? Um, I was wondering your opinion on whether the um Saudi Arabian teams playing on Iranian national soil could actually be a positive thing for Iran? Like, could this maybe make them make more compromises? Could this make them a little bit more subject to kind of whether that's like being held accountable for like different things like their treatment of the national team? Or could it just overall maybe like give some sort of like optimism to Iranians, maybe thinking that now their country might be seen in a little bit more of like a positive light because there are people who are, you know, in support of the regime. There's people who are opposed to the regime. But do you think that overall this could have a positive impact? I mean, I have to say I, I am in favor of, of Iran-Saudi rapprochement just because I think a lot of death and destruction has come about because of the proxy wars and the fight between these two over the last, you know, almost a decade, but seven years in, in particular. The second part of your question is a little bit tricky because then it gets into, um, if it becomes a mask, see that that's why the coincidence of these two events, I think is very, very interesting. And, and why I said at the beginning, I kind of wish I had chosen to go later in the colloquium series because it's happening at the same time that the anniversary of mass Amini is happening. If it ends up that, you know, it it and uh, the games distract attention from the anniversary, from the crackdowns. Then I think, then it's of course it's troubling, because um, then then things like sports washing become relevant actually, because you can see that people are um, the state will have managed to distract. If it becomes, on the other hand, a way to join um, the messaging in ways that soccer has functioned in the past sort of to get rid of these polarities then i then i think it'll be an exciting thing but we don't know we have to wait till the 19th okay anything else All right. Um, so I think we do want to make sure that you get to eat, that we all get to eat. Um, and thank you again so much for this uh, amazing talk, your your insight into this world of media and the ping ponging, as you said, between of the national team between these two uh, polarities, as it were. Um, and thank you so much again, Professor Akhavan. If we could just thank give you her so another. much. You have a great group there. Um, 
lots of good and challenging questions. Thank you to you all. And I hope everybody has a nice lunch and nice week. <laughs> Thank you. Take care. Should I sign off now? Or did you want to yeah. talk to me about anything? Nope. You can go ahead and sign off. We can. All right. Okay. Take care, everybody.